This is a special video for our YouTube and Discord community. Our friend and longtime community member Caesar, a cinematographer from France, agreed to help us analyze, write, and be part of this video on the French film Anatomy of a Fall, giving us a lot of cultural insights we would have totally missed on our own. So enjoy the video and be sure to give a shout out to Caesar in the comments. Imagine the impossible, the one person you cared the most, you trust the most, judged responsible for your downfall not only as a person, but also as a family member. This idea, among others, is the centerpiece behind the 2023 French film Anatomy of a Fall, co-written and directed by Justine Chier. Perched in a chalet in the French Alps, Sandra, a German-born successful writer and wife of Samuel, a French teacher and writer, lives in their secluded home with Daniel. Their 11-year-old son left partially sighted years after an accident. One day, after Daniel's walk home, he discovers his father lying dead in a pool of blood on the snow. Right off the bat, anatomy doesn't seem like your typical legal drama. There is little fanfare about the investigation and the situation is left cold and ominous. And much of the movie is left to the audience to draw their conclusions. Justine Triet said that she didn't want to make another courtroom drama, but rather portray how it could be, like going through such a difficult time and how ambiguous it could be. This postulate is marked throughout the film, which rather follows the life of Sandra as she's prosecuted as the main subject, his lawyer, Vincent, being in charge to defend her, and her son changed forever by the event, trying to gather his feelings around all of it. In many ways, Anatomy of a Fall could be considered as an anti-courtroom drama as the point of the focus isn't about the investigation, but about the point of view of the lives impacted by it. Not only will the trial deconstruct their lives, but through carefully crafted dialogues and ambiguous characterizations and plot points, the spectator is left on the edge over whether or not to believe them. To give you a perspective into Anatomy of a Fall narrative, here are five sequences showing us just how Justine Trier tangles us into her story. Sandra, as she prepares for the trial, gives a recorded talk to a lawyer, introducing how she met Samuel and why she bonded with him. Focus on him, how you met. When we met, he'd just gotten a job at a university in London. She follows by explaining Samuel's personal struggle with work and why he couldn't write his novel, unlike her. Her lawyer corrects her by not giving comparison and sticking to their relationship. Their moments spent together were often moments of intellectual stimulus, while paying little attention to their surroundings. He had, a, he had a way of making everything sound alive and accessible. It was great. Her lawyer reflects if Daniel could have been impacted. She remained silent. He then asked her to talk about what happened to Daniel. At that moment, her perspective shifts. It's okay. It's okay showing us a more vulnerable and uneased Sandra as the camera changes to a tight close-up of her lips and face with a slight high angle looking down on her. She is searching her thoughts before explaining what happened to Danielle. She moves on, holding her breath as she describes what happened that day. Everything changed after the accident. We see through her face the difficulty in recalling the event as if each word coming out of her mouth was spawned upon, almost like hearing herself speaking her mind. That fateful day, Samuel was too busy trying to write his novel, so he called the babysitter to take him back from school. But she arrived late. And while they were crossing the street, young Daniel was hit by a motorcycle. His optic nerve was permanently damaged. After the accident, Samuel felt extremely guilty. After that, Samuel became obsessive. Feeling uneasy, she asks if Samuel's record could be kept clean of that story, also keeping Daniel out of it, and aware if that could be fulfilled. It would be like that. I have to... I have to... Yes. I have to admit things. She argues that she has to admit things not really getting around the fact that her life will be soon brought upon in clear sight for all to see. Now, before going forward, let's clear the elephant in the room. Half of Anatomy of a Fall is actually performed in English, but Justine didn't simply choose it to appeal to a foreign audience, but rather, as we are confirmed later in the film, that English is a middle ground for Sandra, and she uses it to express what she couldn't pass for in French. And as we would later see, the film often switches from English to French, even during a single conversation. Comment il l'a découvert? 
He went through my phone and he discovered- Therefore, the use of English and the use of French by Sandra is a clear marker to convey her emotions and a statement towards a certain position in her family and society. This sequence, however, is a pretty poignant moment in defining both Sandra's character and background as she clearly doesn't know what it's like going through a trial, tripping around subjects with a heavy tongue and not really knowing what could be said and how it should be said. At the same time, we're thrown into Sandra's conflicting thoughts about her husband, her son, and her life. And Justine took great care to choose each word, tone inflection, and camera angle to show Sandra's dilemma. A bit earlier in the movie, after a grueling day of police reenactment for the investigation, Daniel is playing the piano, struggling to play a difficult and energetic piece by Isaac Albeniz. As Sandra comes close to him, he gives up, and his mom starts to play the first few notes of Prelude No. 4, a quiet, lingering, sad piece of Chopin. The pair then shared the piece together, until Daniel, feeling conflicted about the day, runs off on the couch. Sandra tries to comfort him about the day, as he is confused about his memory when he left home just before his father died. This afternoon was hard, wasn't it? Her mother asks if he has lied to the investigators. He nods his head that he didn't. Sandra then tells him that she wouldn't want him to change any recollections or facts about what happened, that he has to tell the truth, and that could never hurt her. I don't want you to change your memories, you know. As she takes her son's hand, she shook it to make him promise. Jokingly trying to make him smile, she embraces and kisses him as night falls on their home. This sequence shows that anatomy although primarily dialogue-driven, also takes great care to give silence as much importance. What the characters don't say, and embodies through presence alone, is equally important. And even in small scenes, it's this balance between what's said and what's felt that the movie exploits to lure the audience's perception into an underlining story. And that story was written by Justine Triet and Archu Arari, who is her husband. And he's also a director and actor. Kind of weird parallel with anatomy and its characters when you think about it. But luckily for Justine, her partner wasn't found dead in his blood in front of her house. One year has passed, and it's the first day of the trial. As we zoom in both literally and physically on Sandra, we hear the recording of the very first sequence of the movie, made by a female university student, as she tries to interview Sandra on her work, while Samuel is working in the attic, playing music at full blast. Getting too distracted by the noise, the interview stops. We are then first confronted by the public prosecutor, immediately starting to question the university student being brought as a testimony. He asks her if she felt something was off about Sandra's attitude towards the interview, and more specifically why she deviated from her questions and instead asks about her. Plus de parler de moi que d'elle que ça... The student just felt she wanted to talk, feeling relaxed and a bit funny. The public prosecutor reminding us that Sandra did in fact serve her and his guest a glass of wine past 1 p.m. and was getting maybe a bit too casual for an interview. Vous saviez que Sandra, comme vous l'appelez, euh, était bisexuelle? Non. As we see throughout the trial scenes, the public prosecutor is really inquisitive and determined, exploiting every word, every meaning and context to his advantage, trying to gather all motives and judgments to rally to his cause and give fierce and hard to counter arguments. And by opposition, since the start of the movie focuses on Sandra and her family, this character seems like an antagonist, a grave and clever opponent, not really likable with how he tries to incriminate Sandra with each step. The first scene of the trial really strikes the viewer and shows how grueling and hard it is to defend yourself, especially when you have a striking and clever public prosecutor and also the added difficulty for Sandra to try to tell it in French. How do you say speaker? Sorry. Une enceinte. Uh, une, une enceinte puissante. Pardon. Which is something that Sandra herself said helps sell the character. That's the great thing about this kind of work when you work with different languages because it's kind of the topic of the film. So the character is struggling with the language. I am struggling. So something is matching. I don't need to pretend anything. It's like my focus must be so much higher and I have to 
listen so much more closely to my partners because they speak French so fast. And I have to answer in English, so I basically had to learn their lines too, so that I don't get lost in what they say. This is why the duality of the movie is also derived through the language, Barrier of Sandra, and delivers a believable performance through her struggle during the trial. A few days have passed. The trial starts to reach its pinnacle, and the debacle between the two parties is in full display. The public prosecutor asks Sandra to talk about the alleged suicide attempt of Samuel. He could not talk about the suicide attempt because his feelings of failure were just too painful. Six months before his death, one early morning, Sandra found Samuel lying on the floor, having drink all night. Having vomited, she noticed some pills partially dissolved, which she understood after finding the packaging of the pills in the trash can. Samuel never wanted to recall that event. Did he... The therapist then cuts Sandra's speech as she thinks that Sandra is omitting her own influence into Samuel's psyche. Il était précipité puisque d'un côté c'est vrai vous lui vous l'encouragiez vraiment à écrire vous vouliez qu'il réussisse mais en même temps vous n'auriez absolument pas supporté qu'il réussisse et c'est It's here that we see another side of Sandra that we haven't seen before. She feels more confident taking her own defense trying to counter arguments with her reasoning and explanation, and also the fact that she switched to English. I mean, sometimes, sometimes a couple is kind of a chaos and everybody is lost, no? And compared to her French speech, she's more poignant, impulsive, and emotional. She goes up front with herself and tries to dodge the statements and judgment brought upon her. Well, the prosecution tries to corner her at each turn. Est-ce que vous aviez du ressentiment? The trial also encapsulates the difference between Anglo-Saxon justice and French justice, which doesn't revolve around the same way of treating and judging someone. In a nutshell, the French judicial system is there to shed light as much as possible, and will try to gather all evidence and judgment not only on the facts, but also on the surrounding factors and motives that could have explained or influenced the case. This sometimes results in interesting arguments between the two parties and the judge, and this battle of arguments is captured perfectly by Justine's film as she spent a lot of time in courtrooms and was helped during writing by a known lawyer. Sir Vincent, I'll uh, let uh, um, my friend try to pronounce this. Vincent Courcel Labrousse. Although they deliberately made the public prosecutor come down to witness at the bar, something you will likely never see in French criminal trial, but the fancy robes are a real thing. After the intensity of a day at the trial, we found our characters at night, drinking in front of the house. Sandra and Vincent, her lawyer, are obviously tipsy and getting loose, laughing and joking around. It's a stark contrast from previous trial scenes, and also the first scenes we see Sandra in such a light mood, and also the first casual scene apart from the very first sequence of the movie. As we have guessed by now, Vincent was actually an old friend of Sandra, and since he became a lawyer, she asked him to defend her. But we were never explained how they knew each other. As we lay our thoughts on them, Sandra breaks the silence, asking Vincent if he remembers how she was like before they first met. To him back then, thought Sandra was a bit lost, lonely but ambitious, and he was desperately in love. A silence falls as they look upon each other, Sandra replying coldly that she can't remember a thing. But I'm innocent, you know that, right? Yes. I mean, really. Sandra suddenly changes tone, implying that Vincent is trying to see through her, just like right now, as she can feel his judgment upon her. Vincent reassures that he believes her, and he doesn't really judge her. They look at each other in silence as the film cuts to the next scene. This sequence is very unique as it first feels like a break in the narrative, showing a more relaxed, mundane part of an exhausting period for those two characters in a more uplifting setting. But it rather serves to strengthen our relation to those characters, showing the special relation Sandra has with her lawyer. And by the end, we are left unsure of what Vincent thinks and why Sandra keeps getting standoffish and so defensive toward her moral position. The swing of emotions for both of them is especially interesting, as the next part of the trial will expose the greatest scene of the movie, which we will not discuss for spoiler reasons, but is probably one of the best pieces of dialogue ever written and performed portraying a couple's life. It's with all those pieces that Justine Trier and Arthur Harari takes us into solving this puzzle. 
giving conflicting postulates, switching from one point of view to another, giving arguments that could be interpreted in both ways, establishing half-truths and questioning our morals. It is this mind game that gives Anatomy of a Fall its strength. From one individual to another watching the film, he or she might draw different conclusions and wonder who is guilty and what matters in the end. Like Arthur and Justine said during interviews, it was their goal to try losing the audience into that duality and never gave a straight answer as to what is true and what isn't. It is this masterful writing and wonderful execution that keeps the movie together and the audience on the edge. And even after being exposed to the narrative, you still find shortcomings and it sticks to your mind as to wonder what really happened. It's those examples and many others that make Anatomy of a Fall a brilliant and intelligent film, taking another angle from the typical courtroom drama and really showing the complexity and sometimes unfathomable human side of people caught in the storm of this mental and moral fight, which might end in either your downfall or acquittal. But if you're looking for some more courtroom drama with a faster, more frenetic pace, check out our video on the five scenes that make Oppenheimer a Best Picture nominee.